Thanks for joining us. My name is Ibrahim Sani. We continue on our coverage of Budget 2023 following the presentation by the Finance Minister slash uh, Prime Minister, Dr. Sri Anwar Ibrahim, on the 24th of February. We're also looking at how this is on the march towards widening the tax base even further beyond just raising personal taxes for the rich. We saw the possibility of an introduction of GST moving forward. We don't know that, but the the idea here is that it truly does present that kind of opportunity. We're looking on the goods, uh, the uh, the luxury goods uh, tax and the possibility of a limited form of capital gains tax as well. Um, and of course, this does signal that the tax structure has been reformed. One such uh, comment that has been given before the budget presentation was that the income tax code was archaic. In fact, uh, the PwC um, the managing partner, uh, Arubindo Ponya, uh, would liken it to an old car. In fact, that would be the first question that I would like to ask our guest for today. Uh, that is, of course, uh, Lavindra. And of course, uh, Lavin is, of course, the tax uh, partner as well there at PwC. So, Lavin. Do you, I guess, agree with your colleague when it comes to the tax code being uh, likened to an old car? Right. Uh, hi, Ibrahim. I uh, hope you're keeping well. Um, that's a fairly diff uh, complicated uh, question, right, whether it's archaic or not. Uh, definitely, there are certain aspects of the tax code that has been sort of copied and pasted into the Act uh, without seeing it from a holistic basis in terms of how the, the tax system would apply to companies and individuals. Now, I think that is expected um, because obviously you can't have a revamp of a, a tax system regularly on a regular basis because that causes uncertainty. But I think from, from, going, from a going forward basis, there is a lot of discussion and um, uh, strategic initiatives in order to sort of simplify the, the tax code, make it a little bit more easier to implement, a bit more structured. Um, so th those are plans uh, that are already in place, uh, you know, to take the tax code to become a little bit more progressive in nature. Um, Lavin, let's talk a little bit more about what you just said earlier, which is, of course, uh, the uh, capital gains tax, um, the uh, signal that the tax structure is going to be, uh, is currently being reformed and that future budgets could have more measures being included. This is all in the pursuit of widening the tax base. Do you feel that uh, the GST, um, however unpopular it is uh, amongst the rakyat, has to be introduced sooner rather than later? In fact, that sooner could be developed in this year even, in Budget 2024, when it is tabled uh, towards the end of the year. There are some factors that uh, we need to take into account in the introduction of GST, which I'm quite sure you are also aware of. And one of the main uh, factors is inflation. If we do introduce GST, and as we have seen in the past, there was a fair amount of increase in inflationary pressures. Now, can the government or can the country withstand that level of inflationary pr pressures at this moment in time, given that the economy may be weakening, is a question mark. Now, okay. if somebody is brave enough to make that call uh, and, you know, with some strategic foresight in terms of what might take place in the future, then yes. And that must be a strong argument for the introduction of GST at this current uh, position that we're in. But, you know, the introduction of GST is no small activity it is one that is massive um and one that can't be undone uh you know uh, through a whimsical uh wave of the wand we saw how malaysia had to suffer from a tax holiday uh, right after the 2018 government took over and that has incurred a loss of revenue uh in the billions of ringgit so this whole idea of reintroducing gst in the country must be done surgically and well do you feel that because of that, there are a lot of considerations that would take into factor, not just on the inflationary pressures that you mentioned earlier, but other factors as well, including the mood and sentiment of the political uh, temperature in the country, when and if it is going to be announced to be introduced? Yeah, uh, definitely that will be a factor to consider. Um, you know, again, uh, the inflationary pressures and that can be used as, uh, as a discussion point. 
but I, I would look at it from more from the perspective of businesses. I think businesses, given that they have already, most businesses have already been uh, subjected to GST. I think the reintroduction of GST may not be uh, something that is uh, unworldly uh, for businesses to re-implement it. Um, I think that would be uh, something that businesses uh, may not be too uh, against. But what I would say is one of the uh, factors that sort of keep businesses awake is this issue about GST refunds. Now, I think if that aspect can be efficient, timely, I think businesses would be quite open. And I think the inflationary aspect of GST can be managed much, much better. Okay, let's move on towards less speculative territory, I guess, uh, and more concrete items that were introduced, including that of the luxury tax. Uh, do you feel that this is a needed item to be introduced today? And do you feel that this is just one of those many measures that the government is trying to widen the tax base? I, I think it's uh, more towards your second point uh, in terms of widening tax base, because this uh, luxury tax uh, is, is more designed for certain high value items right so you can see in some countries uh, in the region that have similar luxury tax uh, they are looking uh, at the tax being imposed on things like uh, expensive watches uh, private jets uh, yachts uh, you know th those kind of areas so it's not so much of a structural matter but i believe it's more of widening the base okay uh, and because of that do you think that this is going to get more revenue for the government substantially or this is more of i guess punishing the t20s um i i don't think it's more of punishing uh, i i don't have the statistics for you know the the amount of those kind of purchases the category of assets that we are looking at um but uh, it it is to cover some uh, i suppose shortfall in tax revenue uh, I think you have also seen that, you know, uh, some of the M40 categories are going to be paying less taxes. So, you know, there are some shortfalls in terms of government revenues that needs to be filled. Okay. Uh, finally, uh, before we go into that break, uh, do you feel that uh, these um, luxury tax um, introduction is going to be further added on in the context of luxury tax throughout the year moving forward? Or do you feel that whatever that has been announced is that, that's just about it. No further inclusion is going to be need, seen until the new budget is going to be tabled towards the end of the year. Yeah, uh, I, I think it would be on your second option, which is uh, I think they're just going to introduce one off. This is how it's going to be. Uh, there could be some introduction in terms of new items coming in as we go along. Uh, but, you know, one thing we have to remember, if GST comes back, then this luxury tax would then have to be removed. Okay. Because there will be an overlap of taxes. Okay. Hence why the GST introduction is actually quite critical as well. Okay, we'll go for one short break but before we continue on with our conversation with Lavindran Sandra Rasi. Thanks for staying on with us. I have with me on the line Lavindran Sandragasu, partner of PWC Taxation Services Malaysia. Uh, Lavin, let's talk a little bit more about the uh, Special Voluntary Disclosure Program. When it was done, uh, if I'm not mistaken, 2018, uh, it was uh, well received. Uh, many tax so called evaders uh, turned up at the uh, IRB's office uh, and volunteered to disclose, voluntarily disclosed the back taxes that they did not pay and because of this there was an increase in income tax following that particular idea of voluntary disclosure program why do you think that the government is doing this again considering that we just did you know four years ago has there been an issue of four to five years of tax evaders and therefore we're trying to see the government claiming back or clawing back the kind of lost revenue from these individuals and companies yeah, so I, I think this is quite interesting. And, um, you know, just to give you a little bit of context, the reintroduction of uh, a program like this is not uh, new. Uh, even if you look at some of the countries in the region, uh, they have uh, had several phases of this 
similar SVDP. So, you know, uh, they've introduced it in year one. Subsequently, after three, four years, they've reintroduced it again. Now, one of the benefits uh, of this SVDP program that when we saw when it was first introduced in 2018 was that revenue collection was quite significant. It was north of 7 billion just on corporate taxes alone, right? So I think uh, there, there is a good reason for it uh, to introduce it at this moment in time. Uh, as you will note from uh, the budget uh, proposals, there is a bit of a shortfall in terms of tax revenue, which we, we also need to uh, mop up. So this is definitely an option. Now, in terms of whether, um, you know, it's, it's something to do with uh, so-called evaders, uh, as you mentioned, uh, to bring, that, bring them back into the fold. Um, it's, it's a bit difficult to say, but if you look at um, what the Prime Minister also said that, you know, uh, monies that have been kept abroad, there are investigations going on uh, in terms of bringing some of these monies back. So uh, I think this is part of the initiatives to tell the, uh, the public, look, guys, bring back your money. Uh, if it's supposed to be taxed in Malaysia, you know, come forward. We'll give you an, it's so-called like an amnesty program, right? Come forward, bring your money back and let's start, let's start with a clean slate. So I think that it, that is more of the initiatives that is being looked at by the but why the uh, voluntary disclosure programs so close with each other? Normally, these disclosure programs, if you look uh, globally, you know, we're looking at some time apart. I mean, I, I don't have the data, but, you know, it's not like three or four years back to back, uh, Lavin. Yeah, so uh, I think it's also part of the uh, sort of reform program uh, that the government is, is pushing for. Uh, they are trying to make sure that the so-called the government ecosystem is ready for, for this kind of reforms. And you, you need, when, when you want to reset something, you need to start from a clean base, right? And, and this is one of the ways of uh, sort of incentivizing people to come forward, uh, companies, individuals, come forward, let's look at it, pay the right amount of tax and let's move on. Okay. Um, another area that I want to ask you is uh, the uh, introduction of the capital gains tax. Um, over the past few days, we've seen how the introduction of the capital gains tax has received mixed reviews. Uh, the proposal to introduce the capital gains tax is on the disposal of unlisted shares and has been welcomed in a move in the right direction by some economists. However, uh, some uh, practitioners um, like my friend, actually, uh, of uh, Scrap Malaysia is arguing that that might disincentivize uh, corporates from trying to invest more in uh, the private space. What's your view on the reintroduction of the capital gains tax? Do you feel that it's significant? And maybe you can contrast this with some of the ideas that how this has been done uh, uh, regionally uh, across other countries. Right. So, obviously, if you, if you look at it from the perspective of uh, a business owner, uh, of course, it's it's not an uh, attractive alternative, right? Uh, because, you know, I, I've built the business, I, I've grown it, and now when I want to uh, dispose of it, uh, the gains are subject to uh, a certain amount of tax, right? So, you know, any amount of taxes is uh, not going to be very forthcoming. Uh, look at it the other way. One is that, you know, um, the country needs money for development, right? Now, uh, this capital gains tax is not new. Uh, the government has has thought about it uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, the the situation was not exactly conducive to introduce something like this, but uh, you know the the government has also put forward the point that the rate will not be uh, too high. It will be a manageable, and they've even used the term low rate, right? To 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 sort of um, you know allow some some of these gains to be taxed. At a reasonable rate, I, I think is something uh, fairly reasonable. Uh, I think if you look regionally and globally, a lot of our neighbors, uh, a lot of the other global countries do have some form of uh, capital gains tax, right? Uh, be it for companies or individuals. So, you know, it, it's not something that uh, it's, it's unknown. Uh, I, I've seen a lot of uh, mergers and acquisitions, uh, particularly coming from overseas. Uh, you know, the first one of the first questions they ask us is, is there a capital gains tax in Malaysia? Yeah. 
because they, they've they've seen it in a lot of jurisdictions so uh, i i don't think uh you know it, it's something new uh it, it's it's a tax that is uh, to allow that that capital gain uh to be brought into uh you know that the tax fold so and and uh, i think economically it also makes sense uh, again from the perspective of government not so much of the business owners because they will probably have a different view um and also uh ibrahim we we have a uh, somewhat capital gains tax for real property companies right so it, it's not something new uh, in in the malaysian scene we do have some form of it it's just that now we are broadening it to uh sale of any com uh, unlisted company shares okay now your colleague uh, jagdev singh the uh, tax leader at wc malaysia uh, argues that the potential cgt should be done in a measured basis what does he mean by that uh Lavin? what does it but what, what does it take to have it at a measured basis uh i, I think he may be uh looking at the the rate itself so you know not to uh sort of hit the whole um, um you know sort of environment uh, in a very um you know hard way so i think it needs to be uh, progressive so it could be even on on certain scale rates uh, it could be you know uh, certain gains made at, at certain levels uh, would be taxed at a lower rate versus gains that are made at a higher level could be taxed at a higher rate uh, there could be exemptions uh, that is accorded uh, particularly when when there's a restructure within the the group uh, more for efficiency purposes as opposed to an outright sale um so i think those are some of the aspects that could be considered uh to to take a measured uh, approach to this okay uh finally i want to talk more about uh, personal taxes uh, we've seen how the personal tax has increased for some and has increased for some uh do you think that this is a sensible move yeah um so uh, the the logic i think behind the reduction uh, particularly it's uh, impacting the the people under between the the rate of 35000 uh, to 100000 uh, in terms of taxable char or chargeable income uh, I, I think that is to provide uh, a little bit of relief right put money back into their pockets right now uh, there is uh, there was a statement in the budget speech that said that that leakage is about 900 million uh, in terms of saving uh, to the populace. Uh, but on the same vein, there's an uh, introduction of uh, 0.5 to 2 percent additional taxes to the guys above 100,000 who are earning more than 100,000. Now, so again, it's it's about a redistribution or balancing uh, of income. Right. So there are some uh, category of uh, income earners whom um, would not be so adversely affected by uh, slight increases uh, in terms of uh, taxes, whereas there will be um, uh, some of the lower income earning groups uh, whereby even small savings will go a long way. So I, I I think that was is the logic behind the, this uh, this balance, um, and of course I mean a increase of taxes I mean nobody really likes it, but um, I, I think we we have to look at a bigger picture what the government is going through what they need to invest in, uh, in you know for the betterment of the country. So okay. we need to take that responsibility on, on us. Yeah. All right. Uh, we'll go for one short break before we continue on our conversation with Lavin of PwC Malaysia. Thanks for staying on with us. I have with me La Lavindran uh, of uh, the uh, Tax Services of PwC Malaysia. Lavin, let's talk a little bit more about uh, the ESG measures and some green initiatives that was introduced in the budget. In fact, uh, there were a lot of chuckles uh, in the newsroom when um, the Finance Minister, Dr. Shriana Ibrahim, was mentioning about some wild animals and uh, uh, the conservative efforts that needs to be done to protect them. But jokes aside, and however hilarious it may sound, at that point in time, doesn't take away the seriousness of us trying to see conserve, uh, uh, conservation 
and the need for us to pump money into conservation being done. That's just one element of the ESG or green initiatives that's been done in the budget. There are many more that have, that was announced. What is your take on this in the budget 23? Um, I, I think it's it's a it's a sensible start. Uh, I think there are a lot more that can be done. Uh, like you said, you know, uh, the focus has been, um, you know, to some extent, uh, conservation, right? Um, there, there is also quite a bit of money that is being allocated uh, in the form of loans, uh, in the form of guarantees. Um, I think BNM themselves has a, a two billion uh, pot uh, in terms of uh, loans uh, that is going to be earmarked for for green uh, for transition of the green economy one and second thing is the introduction of green uh, technologies into businesses okay so I, I think that's one uh, Kazana themselves have allocated about 150 million uh, to be spent on carbon markets uh, as well as uh, certain reforestization uh, there's also the green technology fund and I believe there is another three billion that has been allocated uh, as guarantees uh, up to 2025, I believe, uh, which, so uh, I, I think there's, there's, there's money that has been uh, sort of allocated for some of these uh, initiatives. But one of the things that I, I find that we could have uh, maybe looked a little bit more in detail is, is um, you know, how do we really bring the, or how do we transition, particularly the, the micro and the SMEs, uh, businesses, into the green economy now that's critical because all of us know that smes make a huge part of the gdp right they are the engine of, of you know of growth now so there needs to be some uh, real initiative some thoughts uh, in terms of how do we bring these guys into the uh, uh, or transition them into the green economy so i i think we need a little bit more uh, clarity in terms of that uh, that aspect uh, of the economy. It's also important for us to contrast that for the reduction of uh, business income tax for MSMEs. I think it was 70% before, now it's down to 15%. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Doesn't that help alleviate some of the cash issues uh, for this uh, group of businesses? Okay, so uh, I think what we are looking at uh, in terms of this particular aspect is, is moving towards a green economy, right? transitioning now uh, because smes as as or micro businesses as they are uh, they are quite fixed in terms of their supply chain so the the consideration in terms of uh, making sure their supply chain is green uh, not emitting too much or you know there's a reduction excuse me um it is something uh, very critical and it cannot be sorted out uh, by providing rebates or, or certain reliefs uh, in terms of the amount of taxes you pay, right? Because that portion is is fairly small. I think it's about um, uh, some saving of about three thousand or something uh, based on the reduction of the tax rate from seventeen to fifteen percent. So I, I think it needs to be a bigger thing. It's not just cash flow. It needs to uh, the government needs to make sure the ecosystem that supports the SME and the micro businesses needs to also move towards a, a more greener economy. That's one. Second thing is also, you have this concept of a circular economy, right? So what a circular economy means is like, for example, the usage of plastic, uh, recycling, right? So countries like uh, Netherlands, uh, I think if I'm not mistaken, the last I read was, I think they're planning to help have a full-blown circular economy for the entire um, uh, Netherlands economy by 2030. So uh, that means their, their usage of raw materials will reduce. Mm. It's more energy efficient. Mm. And everybody is in that same ecosystem. It's not just the, the bigger businesses who have more money to uh, you know manage their, their supply chains, etc. Is is only focused on that. For them, they have looked at it as a whole. Everybody, micro, SME, large businesses, everybody is in that same e ecosystem. Now, okay. That is critical. Okay. My conversation with Tanshri Andrew Shang was that in order for us to approach ESG, green initiatives, and energy transition, uh, money is has to be a plenty. 
in order for this to be realized. Uh, and when we're talking about billions of ringgit and perhaps some a lot, in fact, of government intervention, not just government direct funds, but of course, government incentives and initiatives to alleviate investors uh, and facilitate them or incentivizing them to enter this space. Do you feel that those kind of efforts were seen in this budget? Uh, not not to that extent maybe as as what has been explained um like i like i did mentioned you know uh, there's a couple of already couple of billion ringgit that has been allocated right now how much is enough is of course again yeah. depends on on, on uh, you know each individual right but i think the direction is there okay now even if you uh, you know put in all this money right so give you an example uh, ibrahim we had the green uh, uh, green technology fund, right? It's been there uh, for a couple of years, right? And there was an allocation of about two billion odd uh, for for guarantees and loans, etc. Now the take up rate uh, so far has been only about half. Only half of that fund has been dispersed. So there must be something causing that. Now if it's such an important aspect, which is money uh, to to throw into this. Uh, to this aspect of the, econ the the greening of the economy, then why is the take up rate only half? Is the conditions uh, difficult to meet? Are businesses not looking at it? Now, and you must be also fair because in the sense, if you look at businesses, uh, they are always looking for new businesses, right? right. And uh, everybody knows that the green economy has huge uh, potential. Right. I, I think there's some reports by 2030, the green economy is one trillion US dollars, not ringgit. That's, that's huge initiatives. Now, uh, not to forget, a lot of our SMEs are also exporters. And they have to meet the, the, the greening of their products and services in the countries where they are exporting to. So give you an example, the, the uh, Europe is uh, going to introduce uh, certain carbon border tax, right? And uh, so if you don't have the same emission standards as in Europe, and if you produce in an, in a, you know, in an environment where you emit as, as, as much as you like, you're gonna be imposed a tax. Yeah. Now, I'm sure businesses are, are, have thought about that, you know? So they also cannot say, uh, sit back and say, okay, fine, you just impose the border tax because I'm not gonna be competitive, mm. right? So they, they, they have thought about it now how do i then get the ecosystem money is one thing yes but how do i get the ecosystem to to also start towing the line mm. look guys we have to move to a to a circular economy we have to move to a green economy in order to make this work we need mm. to have a strategy we need to have a um, a plan in order for the for the whole country to move together as one uh very short one Navin. uh Generally speaking, overall, do you like this budget? Um, I'm I'm actually quite pleasantly surprised. Okay. <laughs> um, I, right. I, I have uh, seen many budgets in 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 my time. Yeah. Uh, and I think there's uh, there's a different taste to this. Okay, fantastic. That was Lavindran Sandragasu, the partner of PwC Taxation Services in Malaysia. We continue on our coverage on Budget 2023 and the issues surrounding it on Astro Awani. But for now. Thanks for joining us. My name is Ibrahim Sani. Catch you in the next one.